Hi, and welcome to Show Studio. My name is Emily Zak, and we're going to be talking about AI and the future of fashion. And on my panel today, I'll let them introduce themselves. Hi, I'm Omar, uh, AI image maker and creative director. I'm really excited to be here. I'm Wolf, um, I'm a contemporary artist, and I have my studio based in London. I'm Nick Knight, I'm the director of Show Studio. Oh, well, let's launch right in. I think this is an important week. In there's so much happening in this space at the moment. We have um, it's Fashion Week in London. We have Digital Fashion Week. We have there's so much happening with in the AI space this week. And I've been really thinking about, you know, the shift in human storytelling. We're going to get a little meta here. Mm -hmm. Zoom out. We had this huge shift, obviously, from an oral tradition to a written tradition with the invention of the printing press, and then. Further down the line, obviously, the World Wide Web and Internet completely changed the scale of our ability to communicate visually, with words, with expression. And I just wondered, do you feel like we're on the edge or the cusp of another big change? Um, I, I mean, as like I've been working with AI now for about a year and a half, and I think we're just at the beginning of the, <clears throat> the storytelling that AI is going to allow us to do, because there's amazing work coming from researchers that turns a text prompt into an entire movie. So the level of what that's going to do for storytelling beyond just the visual is going to be phenomenal, I think. But yeah, mm -hmm. my opinion. Yeah, I mean, I'm interested in that question a great deal because I suppose chat GTP is uh, what a lot of people are talking about. It's a kind of a buzzword at the moment and it's language based. Mm -hmm. um, uh, natural language. So you kind of go back several thousand years to Homer again before the written script or the scribes and I can imagine that those ancient poets might have thought that the, the great tradition of being able to memorize huge amounts of information then being somehow sullied by the script, the, 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 what they would have seen as a base aspect, which was the, the written word, which would have destroyed a whole tradition. In a strange way, we're kind of returning to that. And it, it's no coincidence that Google um, has uh, launched their competitive um, chat bot, which is connected to the internet, against Microsoft's, you know, or Sam Altman's OpenAI chat GTP3. They've called it Bard. <laughs> so, yeah. I do think it's a, I mean, obviously it goes without saying, it's a really interesting time in culture and humanity and everything, really. Um, I think that the, the, the head spinning part of this is the pace of change. Um, I think, you know, when Gutenberg invented the, the press and sort of, you know, made writing sort of available, um, it took many, many, many years for that to sort of proliferate across the different cultures. And of course, it wasn't the first to, to have done that. But, um, and I think what's really different here is the fact that we are all, you know, since the invention of the internet sort of just over 25 years ago, we are all much more connected as, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a species now. So virtually everybody in the world is, is connected. Um, and so <laughs> ideas like this are rapidly being disseminated. Um, we were talking with Omar just before we started the, the, the panel. You know, uh, literally we, every week there's a new, quite revolutionary tool or um, AI or whatever it is that comes out that really changes the game. Mm. And so not only is this stuff just racing out there and being invented hand over fist and, and absolutely thrilling, it does have that kind of, I'm not sure what's going on moment. It's sort of like being the center of a storm. Mm -hmm. So it's very hard to tell, especially as we're living it and some of us are creating it. Um, it's very hard to tell how big a move, you, know, you can't see the edges because yeah. you're in the middle of it. Mm -hmm. So you don't know <coughs> where this is situated and what's being changed. Um, but I want to tell us what's the, what's the latest kind of, What's the latest thing that's exciting you? I know, honestly, every, every time I come to you, there's always like, <laughs> oh my God, everything's changed again. And, you know, even in the sort of like last week, there has been, you know, there's been revolutions in AI that now mean that we can pose models. So we can actually sort of like not only get consistency, we can now pose them in any particular way. And, 
you know, that, that's... When you, say, I just pick it, when you say pose models, yeah. do you mean, like, find a, a model you pose? Oh, no, I mean, you could take a picture of a model in a pose, so just a regular model, or yeah. you could take a picture off the internet of a pose you like. You can then give that to the AI. Just one picture, by the way, not even hundreds of thousands, just one, and then it will learn the pose. And people are doing... <clears throat> People are using like, this online service where you can pose a 3D model and then instantly take it into any one of the many, many AIs. So, you know, as I said, like, there is, when I'm saying, like, there's constant change. And the, uh, the, the only thing I think that thing is going to make the difference is storytelling. Because how are people using it and what stories are they telling with it? Because, I mean, imagine this is what it was like when the, when the, when the camera came out or when paint first came out. I'm like, I can do anything. Okay, great. And then what happens? I don't know if that's the I'm sorry. I'm, 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 I don't know if that's the same. It's my specialist subject. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Of, go, go, you know, go, crossover yeah, yeah. between painting and probably yours as well. <laughs> but that crossover between painting and photography. Because you hear the, mm -hmm. the sorts of discussions you hear on the internet and on social media around AI. And of course, you know, very concerned artists, mm -hmm. you know, people who are sort of dismissing it and saying, I want to go back to the, the real world and all this <laughs> sort of stuff. Um, it does remind me of what I've read about when painting had to do with the advent of photography. Yeah. You know, and the sort of, it's just a machine, it can never do anything, it's human, blah, blah, blah. Um, which does be, sort of give an arrogance to our position. Because yeah. there is this sort of idea that we are the end of the evolutionary path. Mm -hmm. And of course we're not. Yeah. Any more than, you know, you ask Neanderthal man to, to they yeah. probably thought they were the end of the <laughs> evolutionary path, they knew anything about it. Yeah. So we are just on a road. Yeah. We don't know where it ends. We don't know where we are in it. Absolutely. Therefore, it, it's, it's, a, it's a very sort of arrogant position to sort yeah. of dismiss all this Absolutely. stuff. Absolutely. I think one, one of the things that I, like, a part of my process is that I speak to an AI. So I'll, I'll be talking to GPT 3.5 and we'll have a conversation about, you know, what, what do we expect that's going to happen, you know, especially with uh, you know, Pharrell joining Louis Vuitton. It's been really interesting because Inside GPT, you have 175 billion points of reference. It understands the essence of pretty much any concept that we can ask. So to push into that and then take that conversation with a virtual partner or you know, a team of millions of creative assistants is, is just fascinating. Yeah, I mean, my perspective on all of those thoughts, I mean, uh, let's see, they're all extremely interesting branches of a complex subject. Let's start with the paradigm shift that's occurred right now and the scale of it. Um, we have to sort of perceive this in its enormity. Um, as an example would be that so far we're used to the movement of technology. I won't call it science and I won't call it progression. Mm. We'll, just say, we'll just say it changes, it shifts, we have to deal with these things. And the, the technology is changing at the moment at a, such a great rate. To give an example, you would imagine science at the time of the 18th century, or even, yes, let's, let's imagine the age of enlightenment and how quickly science moved. Well, it's taken hundreds of years to get to where we are now from the age of enlightenment. Mm. But we're going now at the speed of those several hundred years compressed into one year. Mm. Think about week. that. <laughs> yeah. Think yeah. about that. Yeah. And, um, in terms of, this isn't a, technology is not neutral. It's a double-edged sword, of course. There's ethical problems. There's problems about bias. There's, there's problems about people taking polarized positions with this. And that's always natural when there are shifts of this scale. But we can't perceive this as the bad dragon necessarily, or just fall back into a sort of Frankensteinian, Shelley-esque sort of fear. Um, we have to sort of engage with this intelligently and, and ask ourselves, do we need to take a polarised position at all mm -hmm. in, in, in regards to it being, um, it's not against craft, it's not against process, it is iterative. Mm. I mean, you know, this is interesting. Mm. It's interesting because it strikes me, you know, the fashion industry is traditionally very slow to adopt um, change only, I think, largely because it's very much still an apprentice-based craft or learned skill. Um, and I think it's interesting because I wonder if, you know, there are obviously fashion brands that are jumping into this or, or creatives in the space that are jumping into this, but I think there's also some resistance. And I wonder how um, 
how do you, do you think that this, that the fashion industry or the creative industries in general, how, what is their resistance? What, is it justified? What are some of the concerns they may have? I think it's bubbling up this week, obviously, because it's been in the news, but I'm thinking about how some of this could affect journalism, how it could affect mm -hmm. um, crafts that have sort of previously been sort of ring-fenced. Mm -hmm. I'm just curious kind of where, how yeah. it I mean, I, in brief, I would say that um, it really is a question of whether it's going to augment our skill sets and enable us, or whether it's going to replace us. This is the big question, yeah? And at the moment, this is why the open source movement is extremely important regarding this, because we've seen Elon Musk move away from open AI because he didn't feel that it was open enough. We've also seen that OpenAI has done these magnificent things, but, and they need the funding um, from Microsoft to do that. Um, the problem is, is that there are very few people, uh, groups of people in the world that can create these so-called transformer models on, on scale. There's about four companies. Mm -hmm. And these companies then hand it down to us with all of the biases and prejudices and the data sets. So they learn like children, these transformer models begin learning like a, we do, in a sense. Um, I mean, they're, they're obviously, um, they're not parallels to the human mind, but in a primitive sense, they learn like children. They gen just like when we bring children up, they have a sense or slowly begin to sense what the world is without any formal supervision. And then they go to school. Well. These large language models behave exactly like that randomly. They're given tons of data. They learn like children. Um, and then they're supervised. And that's the important point. The supervision point is when, because they are effectively, um, they're like gaming models. They, they work with rewards. So, you so where are you saying the supervision comes from? Is that coming from the user? So if I want to make something with an AI, I'm in, on what I ask it to do, is that what you're thinking is supervision, just so I understand? The supervision is the secondary stage of the training where it, it's a reward system. So you say yes or no, this is racist, this is not. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, bias is not universal. If you gave this um, large, large language model to um, a different country, quite naturally and rightly, they would have different biases to the West. Mm -hmm. So it's not as simple uh, for us to expect open eye to um, delineate that they have a um, diverse team without prejudice and mm. that they will do as best they can to create this large language model that everyone can then through the APIs utilize or build upon in a smaller way. And that's why the image programs led by people like Imad Mostak with Stable Diffusion are so important because what they're attempting to do is create language models for different countries, for Vietnam, for, um, for India, for, um, and at the moment what we're seeing is Google, Microsoft. So there are issues, of course, but, the, but again, we can't perceive this in necessarily a negative light. It, ha it has to start somewhere. Um, uh, we have to sort of recognize that uh, as, as um, in, in, in terms of ethics and in terms of law, and, of, and, and all of the issues from copyright up, um, uh, from ground zero upwards, we have to recognize that this can be dealt with in a positive light as well, a very positive light, because the upside of this is enormous. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think I'll just add to like the, the, the question about what this means for fashion. I think there's just, you, you know, one of the experiments um, over this week, I think, you know, talking about like, the idea of like this technology being in people's hands, like someone like me, I can I can make images where I can suddenly sort of like go, let's look into this five billion images, this like cloud of images, and now let's start pulling out concepts. Let's let's extract essences of people. So there's this amazing sort of like the actual creation process. But what this means on a sort of like actual tactical brand level, it's it's phenomenal. Like suddenly for the first time ever content and creation can keep up with creativity. So someone, you know, fashion, I mean, it's really interesting hearing you say that because as someone like I, I worked in advertising for the longest time and we always looked at fashion as 
the, the industry that is always moving forward. You know, it's yeah. the first industry to sort of really take on the metaverse. It's the first industry to take on NFTs and stuff to actually sort of incorporate in that in technology into its, uh, into its um, fabric. So I think as more and more and more things happen, you know, I'm, I'm really expecting, I think the, the thing that's going to be really interesting is AI with personality. You know, when are we going to see the world's first AI designer that has a personality that doesn't want to do what you want to do, that actually has its own sort of like, you know, has its own sort of like flounces. Like, you know, what keep watching Icon 1. Yeah, 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 yeah. You know, honestly, like when you look at these images, like these images were created by trying to extract what Pharrell's essence is, yeah. not just beyond his sort of like his designer ethics, but I, I taught this AI all of his lyrics. I taught it all of his like, you know, all of his secret collaborations, all the stuff he did at NERD. So when you see these images, they're actually pulling not just from our latest version of things, they're pulling from things that are beyond our human comprehension, which I think as a lazy person, I think that's amazing. <laughs> like, let the machine do more stuff. Does it matter who's creating it? I think you touched on this a little bit. You yeah, said I mean, it does matter in well, terms of biases. Autonomy is one of the biggest questions of postmodernism. And essentially, I think we have to sort of honor the fact that these, this AI is it's not the other. Um, it's not something that has suddenly happened, although actually it's been around, a lot of these ideas of trans transformers have been around in the 70s. It's not like mm. they're, I mean, they've been adopted these algorithms now as they've realized the algorithms can learn, so it's a big deal. But the, the point is, I think, what, what is fascinating is that if you go back in time to the 17th century, Leibniz had this idea, you know, the philosopher Leibniz. So, okay, he was developing calculus, but he was also developing ideas about computers and communication. So this goes all the way back to Leibniz. What was, um, what was Leibniz saying? He was sort of, it's not the same, but he was engaging with this idea of uh, uh, developing an, um, an artificial understanding. Right. Like a kind of a language model. Yeah. And you, you, you have to sort of also question this idea of what it is to be a creator, because a lot of artists, quite understandably, may be under the illusion that they have full autonomy. And, you know, you look at these poets like John Donne from the 16th century, they will say, no, no, no person is an island. Mm. And we know this. We all know that if, say, Raphael Sanzio um, had walked into the Sistine Chapel, which was not his work, mm. with the key given to him by Donato Bramante, and he didn't take the influence of that to the School of Athens, we wouldn't have Raphael's culture. Uh, so it is sharing. Mm. If you look at the recent, let's go to fashion for a moment, uh, of Chanel's um, Paris 2023 presentation, quite clearly it was influenced by Malevich and Dadaism and all kinds of things. So everyone is to one level or another and should be allowed, and it's their human right to appropriate on one level or another. But where do you draw the line? So this is the question. And that, that the biggest issue at the moment, of course, is the data sets. Oh, they're, they're, these data sets are filled with medical records or they're stealing from artists and so on. And it's not that simple. No. It's, it's very complex. Mm. Um, and the, actually, the law, the law courts regarding all of these problems haven't yet sorted any of this out. No one knows. Mm. No, they're way behind. Yeah. The laws are kind of yeah. st still yeah. dealing with the advent of the internet. Yeah. It's real. And, you know, I think we were talking about it before, this, this idea of, like, you know, being able to train, train your own AIs with a very small data set. That means one Google search and you can basically replicate someone. I think what you're saying about the, the size of the databases and what lurks inside, I think, for me, it's been really important to always ensure, like, how do I create diversity in my images? Like, how do I, not only body diversity, race diversity, gender diversity, we can move not, not to a, a post-gender space, but I think it's really interesting because these are illustrations, mm. they, they don't hold the same sort of like, they are beyond us, right? So I think a lot of, uh, I did a, a, a big amount of work last, last month to really explore like, where are the outer edges of diversity inside this model? Where can I take them? Can I, can I, show, can I show race? Can I show age? Can I show gender? And honestly, I think, for what, what I realized through that experiment is, is it's the asker, it's the artist. So if you want to see, if you want to see diversity, you can ask it to see yeah. diversity. So the question is, beyond the, it's naturally a specific way, or if it's naturally a specific way, it, because it's, it's not a entity, 
it's for us to sort of like guide it into a space. Like, no, absolutely, Omar. And, and also, Nick, you, you don't blame the camera when a bad actor is behind the camera. You, you, you blame the person who's mm. taking the photograph. Yeah, I blame myself. Yeah. <laughs> and so you can't blame the AI. You have to blame yourself. And the answer isn't to have um, a set of um, an enlightened team to tear from all of the data what they feel is inappropriate. Mm. Um, this yeah. is why I believe that the open source side of it is quite mature. Yep. I mean, yeah. on, on that point, you know, if you, are be, if you are a creator, as you said, and so putting myself in that place, when I'm working, when I'm trying to create an image, you're not copying something. Yeah. You're basically responding to something happening in front of you. But it's never like a sort of factual... It's, you're caught up in an emotion, so you're almost creating out of spontaneity. Mm -hmm. And you're putting... And I don't know if it's the same when you paint or when you work, but it, it's... You know, you're pulling from an unconscious part of your mind. That's why the whole thing when people try and resolve ideas, there's a part of your mind you go to, which often you're not engaging. And some people like Tom Ford says, I, you know, I have three baths, three hot baths a day because in the bath I can think. I remember I used to drive around London at night because the act of driving would disengage a creative part of your mind. Mm. So there are sort of interesting areas like that. So you're not figuratively thinking, oh, I know what Richard Avedon or Guy Bourdin yeah. did and I wanted to look, to look exactly yeah. like that because that's a very frustrating and very pointless yeah. place to arrive at. Um, I just sort of wind us back one question mm. um, just because I think you, you are something about the fashion industry. Um, and you said the fashion industry, you know, have difficulty with it. I think the thing there is the fashion industry. So it's the business part <coughs> of fashion Indeed. which has problems and slow uptake because they are too worried, I believe, yeah. about losing their ways Priority. of making money, yeah. to put it bluntly. Yeah. So that's why we saw after the pandemic, instead of, you know, lots of designers having a new model to show, you know, their the catwalk, they, you know, they all, re or a lot of them reverted back to the physical catwalk mm. because it wasn't clear how they could make money or how they could fit into that money-making system yeah. you know, if they came off the catwalk. So I think the fashion industry is slow to adopt. Mm. I think yeah. fashion yeah. itself is super fast. Yeah. Yeah. In a way, fashion is a predictive medium. Mm -hmm. It should be the most out of all the arts. Yeah. It should be the medium that looks into the future and says, you know, in, in six months, you will definitely want to be yeah. like this, wear this, mm. you know, have this sort mm. of you know, yeah. persona. Um, so I think it, it, is, it isn't fashion that's slow to adopt. <coughs> it's the fashion industry. And the industry that sort of like any other keeps industry it. Yeah. is terrified or quite no, right. I think that's a, a really good distinction, actually. I mean, I'm thinking when I say it's been slow, it, it, it was slow as an industry to adopt to digital. Mm. Um, yeah. You know, you were leading the way here, so it's sort of I'm speaking to the converted. But I think it's also interesting thinking about um, sort of what makes us distinct in our human creativity. You've talked about your creative process. I'm very interested in how this is going to inform and change creative process in general. Mm. And you know, I, I, the, the cognitive philosopher, uh, Daniel Dennett, sort of famously said in an interview that you know, we're robots made of robots, made of robots, made of robots, at a cellular level. Mm. And on some level, AI has kind of mimicked you know, the human brain, the neural networks that we think are in the, in the brain, at least. Um, and I think there's something very interesting. It's like I, I've always thought that human creativity and human ex sort of creative expression was very distinctly human. So now I think that's. Are you I'm stumbling across questions. the biggest question that's never been resolved in philosophy right. here? Let's go for it. What do we think? Yeah, I could tackle that one. <laughs> oh, good. Yeah. Okay. So let's see. The, the the problem seems to be what is it that makes us distinct from mm. the robot? Uh, probably nothing. Eventually. Uh, but that doesn't mean we're the same. Um, the, I'm not going to say that robots within... If you, give, if you train a model well enough, perhaps it can understand some ethics. If you train a model well enough, it can... All of those things, those elements that make, we believe make us human, our creativity, our ethics, our subjectivity, mm. our self-consciousness, all the things that we, th we believe make us distinct are dissolving now, slowly. And this is obviously a great threat to us as human beings. However, there's a, there's a larger philosophical problem, um, which has been around for a long time. It's, it's, it's called the ghost in the machine. Gilbert Ryle talked about it. Um, and it, it, it's, it's this, there's this notion that somehow we have a dual life. There's this 
cinema show going on in our head, which is our mm -hmm. soul, and then there's this material world that we all live in, and somehow they connect. Descartes, Descartes said, oh, they connect through the pineal gland or some sort of fake out like that. <laughs> but but the, the problem with, um, when you listen to a great deal of these CEOs at the tops of um, the AI tree, the, the issue that seems to be the case is because they're scientific computer engineers and they're also hedge funders and uh, they also tend to be, um, uh, you know, sort of investors, they, they're, they're, they're very prejudiced towards this idea of, a, of, of de, de, deconstructing everything towards materialism. So, so their scientific ideas are always going to relate back to a sort of Stephen Hawking's like, mm. well, how do we reduce this to a, a, a scientific idea mm. or way of thinking? And language doesn't necessarily work that way. The, the human mind isn't necessarily um, a circuit board mm. or uh, the, the neurons, they will say, oh, they're very efficient. They work 100,000 times better than chat GTP3 and they move in liquids. And, but they, they think about it in terms of, or try to, in terms of science and chemistry. Mm. Whereas if you look at contemporary philosophy like Ludwig Wittgenstein's philosophy of the, 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 the 50s, you'll realize that no, they've moved, philosophy's moved away from this dualism. Language is in the world, it's what we share. There's, there's nothing in between us and understanding. Mm. And it doesn't have to be um, reduced to this material idea. So the concern is, is that if they are pushing for this idea of what they call a singularity or that we eventually will in some way become transformed into meta, you know, meta humans and half machines and the only way to deal with the, the general AI intelligence, um, AGI, uh, would be to for us to also become like the machine. That's not necessarily the only way. Mm. But isn't it just this sort of goes back to what I was saying at the beginning? If you, if you think we're the end of the evolutionary journey, then yes, it, it, has, it poses a great threat. If you if you if you can divorce yourself from that and say we're just part of this journey, the journey is the maintain the maintenance of intelligence. It's not the maintain maintenance of the humankind. Mm -hmm. Um, it's quite possible over the next 1,000 years, 10,000 years, 50,000 years, we will slowly start to adopt the technical within our beings. Mm. And it's quite possible, you know, the, the ultimate intelligence, the, the next step in the big evolutionary change will be cyborgs. Yeah. Yeah, because we're a carbon-based life, life yeah. form that has intelligence. doesn't mean that a silicon-based life form cannot have intelligence and, and might have a much better intelligence than we are. Yeah. And if we, for a minute, say, so, okay, well, maybe the universe is devoid of intelligence other than this little tiny spark in our solar system. There's no evidence that there's intelligence anywhere else. There's lots of little clues that might be, but there's no evidence there is. Yeah. So we can have a hypothesis that says the universe is devoid of intelligence other than us. Yeah. Then our huge role is to proliferate intelligence yeah. and not arrogantly maintain the human species. Absolutely. So it's just a different mm -hmm. sort of... No, sure, but intelligence costs money. This is the funny thing. Um, but it these, didn't before these, there was money. Uh, I don't know. I mean, um, just to begin the, a, a transformer model today, to, yeah. to, to, to buy intelligence, because this is what they're doing. This is why they needed Microsoft. Yeah. Uh, they, they, well, let's actually go to these text-to-image models like Stable Diffusion. I think they had to buy 4,000 RTX NVIDIAs or something. I mean, that's, they're, they're about 4,000 each. 4,000 what, sorry? 4,000 of these pre-built computers that have a lot of CPU and oh, really? VRAM. Oh. Um, so for, they're, they're about at least four or six, well, I'd say about $4,000 each or something. So you're already yeah. talking about a, I don't know, 16 million output there of, of, of dollars to, tr to create a yeah. trans, to train. <laughs> that's, that, that's without all of buying all the data and all working with open source data. So essentially anyone who's going to sort of buy this intelligence or try and control this intelligence is going to need an out a, a, a minimum amount of 50 million, a minimum, and very few people do that. Um, but, you know, the, the economy of intelligence going back through history, in a sense, has always been there. This is why the Vatican has so many books. You know, it's, this is why Alexandria <coughs> created a huge library and a powerhouse of all of the great texts, because they knew that knowledge was power. Mm. Um, but What's the Tower of Babel? Isn't that a seat of learning, or is it just a seat of language? Yeah. Yeah, I believe that was a, um, in, in, um, it, it was a, 
So I'm not putting you on a spot. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, it was a myth in the Bible um, uh, where, everyone, the the Bible. where everyone was speaking many different um, languages and then, um, no, where everyone was speaking one language beforehand. Right. So it was like a kind of unified language, mm. a little like um, Latin or something. And then um, they tried to build this so high, it was an Icarus story, yeah. mm. that, um, that God destroyed one language and created um, many languages. But it collapsed into many languages. It that, did, is and, that now, the story? and now chat GTP3 is trying to sew that back together. <laughs> Actually, that's the whole panel in one, in one sentence. But I think one of the really interesting things about, like, you, you know, as a practitioner, I think the one thing I can definitely say that, like, for me, there's one word about what, what's different between humans and a machine, and it's curiosity. Mm. A machine, like, if I, the minute I step away from any of the AIs, they're not going to be exploring the universe of ideas. They couldn't care less about it. So there is no curiosity about them. So, you know, even this, the, what you're seeing now, I, I'm, I was really curious about, I wonder wonder what a camera would look like if it could see behind itself as well as in front of itself. Mm. I mean, it completely doesn't make sense. You know, mm. light doesn't work like that. But the AI would go and try to make those images. Now, it wouldn't try to invent that camera on its own. So I think, you know, and as you said, I think the really important thing is, like, we are not at the end of our creative journey before we move on to AI. I think we've been evolving since the first spark mm. of life. So we are going to constantly keep evolving. Mm. <clears throat> I mean, we're, we're already in the... We're already cyborgs. Like, we just carry our like main computer outside of our bodies. Mm. I mean, that, we're not that far away from like actually integrating it when the glasses come out, when all of these new future technologies come out, where everything we, you know, a, we'll just have another layer of reality or, mm. on the reality. Uh, absolutely, and I don't think we necessarily need to use the term cyborg either. Um, imagine a situation. That's the term. I mean, it's, it is wonderful, but the if you go back, say, forty thousand years, and you have some woman in a cave with hands saturated with blood and she makes this print on the cave wall. Perhaps that shaman, shaman the, 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 this sorcerer, was convinced that the relationship between her body and the wall and whatever she was communicating, was, it was necessary that she used her hands because it was connected to her body. But Let's just say that another shaman, shortly after, uh, several hundred years later, took a stick of charcoal and said, I can get a final line with this. Well, there would have been a serious issue. Mm. You know, you're, you, you are now becoming the stick. You know, you're not becoming a stick, you're simply using another tool. It's yeah. a, yes, it's a paradigm shift from the hand on the wall, but you're using a stick. Now, this isn't superior to the hand on the wall. It's another way of communicating. That's all. Mm. And AI is not an independent other. Mm. It's not going to change us into a cyborg. It's just like the stick. Yeah, mm. yeah absolutely. And I just wanted to add, like, what you were saying about the, the Transformers and the sort of, like, the, the difficulty in making AI. I think it was so interesting. Like, you know, even in our... It, I think when I first came to talk to you, I was like, it's, it's impossible because they cost millions and millions of pounds. And even, even this week, there's been a new, a new development called Laura where with less than 10, minute, 10 images, you can now train any model. And I think, you know, one of the things that I've, I'm working on is training the d most diverse model I can imagine. Like, how do we... It's, it's my responsibility, because if I can understand AI, surely why would I wait for the CEO or hedge fund managers to do it when I can exactly. just do it myself, when I can pick up these tools mm. as someone who doesn't understand coding, watch some YouTube videos and just make it? Because this, as a creator, this... this this accessibility, this divert, it allows so many more voices. I think, I think AI is going to allow so many more voices to actually be a part of a creative, uh, creative canon. It's going to be incredible. I mean, I guess one last question um, to, to, to discuss for me is, is, is sort of maybe a little less esoteric. Um, you know, AI can solve some very practical problems the fashion industry has. Everything from fit tech, you know, to help there's so many sort of mm. problems that are right now practical problems that, that the industry, that brands have, that AI, I think, could be brilliant at sort of solving. Mm. There's that. And I also think there's this idea that somehow the aesthetic of AI is very futuristic. It's, there's a kind of li very limited idea of what mm. that looks like. And what excites me, and I'd love to hear from you all, because I know this is, um, you all care about this. You're in this space mm. as well. Um, it's also it's not just this very limited view of what like a futuristic mm. 
AI image looks like. It can draw on old masters, which I know you both, it draws on some of the older, you know, the ancient kind of techniques and sticks and tools. It's not just canceling those out. It's mm. bringing them all together to yeah. some extent. Yeah. I think for me, it's, it's really, it's been a fascinating thing to actually, if you imagine all of these ideas existing in the past, with AI, you can combine them in a way that's just never been imaginable before. You know, I can see furniture designed by Michelangelo. Like, what would he have made? Like, you know, what does his IKEA furniture look like? Like, mm. any any concept of mixing and matching. You know, what you were saying before about copyright. Copyright needs to catch up because these tools are now away from the cloud. No one can take these tools off us anymore. Like my my tool, tools exist on a laptop. So we are now they're sort of like. Yeah, I mean, this is a huge smoking gun, <laughs> and. Um, so far as I can see, the, the main data sets that are being used, or one of the larger data sets, is called Lion 5 b And it's developed by some perfectly well-intentioned German open source uh, non-for-profit uh, people that wanted to try to do something that was available for the larger masses that didn't have to ask permissions from Microsoft or Google. Um, they were not paid huge sums of money to do this. They were given donations. The, the data set for this, I believe, mainly comes from Amazon Common Crawl. And this in itself is compiling millions or billions of images that everyone using an iPhone right now or on Facebook has unfortunately or fortunately placed their consent and they, they do this all the time now because they don't want to read into all of the details. Yeah. Mm. So, they will con so, so nothing's actually illegal. However, the, the companies have taken out of the data set all of the celebrities, all of these images, but of course they released it beforehand, so now it's viral. Everyone can obtain the original data set um, with all of these informa all this information. Now, at this stage, you have to ask yourself, well, is that really a terrible thing? Because there's a great misconception about how the AI is trained. People feel that it, it's like collage. You throw it all in a bucket, and somehow it's stuck together, and it's their work. You know, this is a bit of this artist, a bit of that artist, and so on. It's not how it's done. It's done through latent imagery. The, the images are effectively destroyed with noise and then rebuilt. So the, it's the equivalent of, say, any of us going into, say, the National Gallery in London and looking at Van Gogh's sunflowers and being inspired by it, going away and trying to remember aspects of it that we want to use in terms of its inspiration with our work. Um, now, of course, you can, get with image to image, make something ex entirely similar to something else, but that's under normal copyright law anyway. Mm. So, so on the second level, in terms of what you do with that, whether it be the old masters or um, Heider Ackerman or yeah. uh, Jean-Paul Gaultier or whatever, whatever you do with it, you, you're not interested in pastiching those wonderful things. You're interested in being inspired by them. So when Nick or Omar or myself engages with this exciting new technology, we're engaging with all of those problems and all of those issues as best we can. And we recognize, I, I, I hope we recognize it's, a, it's an extremely complex iterative and process. So, so it's a feedback. It's not like it's a one-click mm -hmm. scenario. If it ever does become an automated one-click scenario and the, the, the companies are interested only in producing a bypass of all artists and creativity, then we've got an issue. Yeah. Uh, then it's just commercialized, and we've got what you mentioned very early on in the talk regarding Nadar and photography and mm. the beginnings of photography when Baudelaire said, oh, well, photograph photography will never become an art mm. uh, because it will just flood the world with rubbish. Well, of course we're going to get that. Yeah. But we also got Nick and other things. <laughs> so, yeah. so you got better than me, but thank yeah. you. So, so, so I'm just sort of saying that um, yeah. if, if artists engage with this with an open mind, and realize that it is a genuine creative and iterative process that has no polarized um, mm. uh, uh, position and also invites just as much when Henry Ford created the car, the horse on the road is still here, the horse is still here, the gondolas are still in Venice, the black cabs are still in London, 
you know, and yeah. the painters are going to be around for centuries. I still paint a great deal, <laughs> so you know, I'm painting most of the time. But we cannot ignore this paradigm shift any more than Brunelleschi, when he invented perspective, expected all of the artists, Masaccio and everyone else, to just say, oh no, we're going to be like Andrei Rublev, I think we're not going to do this. The important difference here is that is the sort of forces behind it, that artists should be involved in this, and they, they almost have yeah. a sort of duty in some ways yeah. to be involved in this, because otherwise the big players aren't so artistic, shall we yeah. say. Yeah. It's the military, yeah. it's, it's the big business, yeah, absolutely. it's unsavory yes. types. Yeah. Yes. And if you look at it in sort of grand ways, these are people who are some way you know, creating the future. I would rather live in a world created by artists, yeah. however weird and difficult that might be, than a, than a, than a world created for, you know, by people who get money from killing. Yeah. You know, so you, I think it is important. And when I do talk to young photographers or image makers who, some of them are quite against it for they don't understand it and they fear it and they don't, you know, they think it's all, all devoid of, of, of soul. I try and say, it's, but it's important that you get involved. Yeah. That you are the people with soul and yeah. understanding here. You have the kind of, you know, in a way we can, and I don't keep on debate it because we haven't got time now, but, you know, artists are a sort of, you know, a, a slightly sort of, in every culture, they're sort of considered the sort of, you know, in some way elevated position yeah. to comment on that culture. Mm. And therefore it is them that must be involved yeah. in the creation of our futures. Mm. Um, otherwise it's created by business. Absolutely. Um, and it's created by, by the military who are pushing forward like there's no tomorrow. Yeah. Hand in hand with all the conflicts going on, they're yeah. having a field day. You know, I think one of the things that you touched on earlier, you know, the, the legality I think is really interesting because, yeah, terms and conditions, we've been putting, th we've, been, we've been hand feeding the AI for years and even now you know the idea of like yeah there's so many hedge funds like the the VC world is still rampant in the space so you know I would really urge anyone one we do like as artists we now have the technology to create absolutely magnificent things please learn about it otherwise please read the terms and conditions especially on things like mid-journey they have it in really big bold writing like mm -hmm. you know who is the owner of like we're now teaching these machines which are learning off our images so it's this perfect feedback loop the smartest most creative people in the world are feeding AI to make the most gorgeous images and that is going to become a, yeah. a cycle. Do you think, I mean just because I know we're running out of time we might have to take this conversation uh, offline now, but just, I think that's actually a very, very perfect, it's a perfect place to end. Um, it's basically, if you're an artist, if you're a creative, this is a, a plea, a suggestion, yeah. a hope that you will engage in the space. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I think we might have to end with that, but it's a brilliant discussion. And thank you so much for joining us at Show Studio. <laughs>